This is a short video about oscillation. We'll define oscillation. We'll talk about what an oscillator is and also what it isn't. We'll also go over the words that get used to describe oscillators, the terminology that physicists share when they talk about things that oscillate. In class, you will be studying oscillators and talking about them, so we'll use agreed-on language to avoid ambiguity to make sure that when your lab partner tells you, say, that she measured an amplitude of five centimeters, you and she agree on what that means. So what is oscillation? Oscillation is repeated cyclical motion. The universe is full of naturally occurring oscillators, and they have a lot in common with the more contrived machinery that we'll tinker with in class. Right now, we're looking at a classic example of a natural oscillator that's important for anyone who works on or around the ocean, the tides. If you've spent any time near the ocean, you know that the water level goes up, and then it goes back down again. After low tide, it takes a little more than six hours for the water to rise and six to fall over and over and over again. The water level could be said to oscillate. By the way, the Bay of Fundy, pictured here, has particularly famous tides because the drop from high tide to low tide can be more than 40 feet. That's a lot, given that in Boston Harbor, the difference between tides is only about three or four feet. If oscillation is repeated motion, it's also an example of periodic motion. Periodic motion is cyclical motion in which each cycle takes the same amount of time as the last cycle. Notice that there's a place in the middle of an oscillation where if the system is left alone there and not disturbed, it will stay there. If we put the ball somewhere else in the system and let go, it won't sit still. That center position is called the equilibrium. Notice that the ball moves through the equilibrium when it's oscillating, but if we grab the ball and just put it at the equilibrium, it's going to stay there. One last thing. For our purposes, oscillation is at least approximately symmetrical. The ball goes as far to the right as it goes to the left. For contrast, here is a system that's not symmetrical. There is a repeated motion, and there is an equilibrium, but the equilibrium isn't in the middle of each swing. Now, reasonable people might argue about whether this is an oscillator or not, but for our purposes, we're going to say that this is not an oscillator. Let's talk about how we describe oscillators. Here's a list of terms that we use to describe oscillators and how they behave. And, and we use these terms so that we can be precise in what we're saying. For instance, we don't say that an oscillator is fast or it's slow. I mean, we can do that, but we try not to in a physics context because that's ambiguous. If someone said the oscillator sped up, they could be understood by different people to mean different things. For instance, one person might he hear them to mean that the ball rolled towards equilibrium, and as it did that, it started out slowly and it increased in speed as it got toward the bottom of the bowl. But another person might think that increased in speed meant that each cycle took less time because it was, it was, it was completing each cycle more rapidly. But we can't really be sure because we're not, we haven't really defined what we mean by speed or fast for an oscillator. So to avoid that problem, we use these key words. The first one is cycle. The definition of cycle is for us is essentially one round trip. When we talk about a cycle of an oscillator, we talk about the oscillator going down and then up and then down again. And that's it. We could measure from up to down and up again either also, or from the middle down to the bottom, up to the top and back to the middle again. In either case, a full cycle is one full round trip. The next three terms describe things that you need to know how to measure in the lab. And the first of these is called amplitude. Amplitude measures how much something changes during the oscillation. If we think back to the tides, we could compare the Bay of Fundy to Boston Harbor by saying the amplitude of the tidal change is greater in the Bay of Fundy than the amplitude of the tidal change in Boston. More specifically, the amplitude of an oscillator is measured from the equilibrium point to the point of maximum displacement. Now here's the marble in the bowl again. We can see that it gets pulled back to the 10 centimeter mark on the left, and it goes as far as the 20 centimeter mark on the right. So what's the amplitude here? Now if you aren't immediately sure, you should pause the video
so that you can think for, about this for a moment. And then you can start the video again and check your answer. Seriously, if you're still listening, I hope it means that you have an actual answer in mind. You're not just waiting to be told. Okay, I hope the amplitude you were thinking of was five centimeters, about five centimeters. Why five centimeters? Because that's how far it is from the left-hand side, the location of greatest displacement from equilibrium, to the equilibrium. The second of the three most important terms is the period of oscillation. The period of oscillation is the amount of time it takes for the oscillator to complete one full cycle. Let's go back to the tides again. We said that the water level changes a lot in the Bay of Fundy, and in Boston Harbor, the water level doesn't change as much. These two have very different amplitudes. But let's look at the period of the tides. In the Bay of Fundy, the time that elapses from one low tide to the next, if you read the graph carefully, is about, well, from 3 to 15, or about 12 hours. Notice that the time from one high tide to the next, from one, excuse me, the time from one high tide to the next, right, is also about 12 hours. Let's compare that to Boston. High tide to high tide in Boston, also about 12 hours. So here are two oscillators that have very different amplitudes, but the same period of oscillation. In the lab, we typically have to measure the time with a stopwatch. We might want to time one cycle just like this. We look at the, the oscillator and just get one cycle. We grab a stopwatch and start. And, and one cycle just doesn't take very long to happen. So typically, we, what we do if we want a careful measurement is that we measure a whole bunch of cycles and then we compute the time for one. So here we'll time the oscillator and we'll count the cycles. Start, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, stop. Okay, so notice that I said start. I didn't say one until the next cycle was completed, and then I hit stop when I meant to ten. Anyway, we've got a total of ten cycles, um, and I got about eight and a half seconds for those ten oscillations. But what's the period? How do we find the time for one cycle? Uh, well, we know the time for 10 cycles, so we can divide. We'll take the number of seconds. For 10 cycles, we'll divide by 10 to get the number of cycles in one second. You ought to be able to divide by 10 without a calculator. I'm hoping you can do that in your head. Um, and find that the period is 8.5 divided by 10, or 0.85 seconds. That's the amount of time it takes for one cycle. The third important descriptor is frequency. Frequency is a measurement of how many times a cycle is completed in a given amount of time. I'll grab a stopwatch, we'll measure this. This oscillator moves pretty rapidly, so it's, it's hard to count. And if you run into this problem in the lab, ask for help, because there's some really good tricks to help to use to deal with this problem. But here we go. So we're going to go start, one, two, three, four, stop. And so I've got five cycles, and let's see, about 3.6 seconds. Um, and so if I've got five cycles in 3.6 seconds, how many cycles happened in one second? Well, we'll divide the number of cycles by the number of seconds on a calculator. 35 divided by 3.6 is, well, the calculator says it's 1.3888888. We don't want to use all of that. So I'm going to just write down it's 1.39 hertz. Um, Note that the, the unit of time that we use could, could be anything. Um, the number of cycles in one unit of time, I, we could say, for instance, you know, how many times a week do we have assembly? That would be assemblies per week. Your heart rate is typically measured in beats per minute. That would be beats per minute. But in this class, most commonly, we'll talk about cycles per second. How many times does something happen in a second? And there is a special name for the unit of cycles per second. It's called Hertz. It's got a capital H and it's abbreviated HZ. Um, notice also, just a side note, if you look closely, the period and the frequency are reciprocals of one another. Now the rest of the terms that you should know are really just terms. They're not things that you have to calculate. So here's one, the restoring force. The restoring force is a force that returns the oscillator to equilibrium. 
With this simple pendulum, when the pendulum is over to the left, gravity acts to the right, trying to bring the pendulum back to equilibrium. Similarly, when the pendulum is over on the right, gravity acts back toward the left, also bringing the pendulum back to equilibrium. So in this case, gravity is clearly the restoring force. There are some situations where this is also, uh, it's a little trickier, let's say. If we think about a mass hanging from a spring, it, it's not quite as simple. So here, we have a mass that's hanging from a spring. It's going to bounce up and down. And when, when we think about what, what's going on with the mass at the top of its bounce, gravity is acting down toward equilibrium. The spring is pulling up away from equilibrium. In this case, gravity is stronger than the force of the spring, so the mass accelerates back towards equilibrium. On the other hand, when it's below equilibrium, when the mass is down here, gravity is the same as it was before, but the spring has a stronger force because the spring has been stretched out, right? When the mass is down low, the spring is longer. It's been stretched, and springs pull harder when they're stretched out. It's how springs act. And so in this case, it's a little trickier. What's the restoring force? Well, when the mass is above, gravity is pulling towards the equilibrium. And when the mass is below, the spring is pulling towards equilibrium. So a person could argue that there are two different restoring forces. Um, somebody else could argue that, well, there's only one restoring force and it's made up of the combination of the two. And it's not really worth quibbling about. But just to point out that this can be a little bit more complicated. Let's talk about the concept of driving. Here we are back to the uh, marble in the salad bowl, and we're going to drive its oscillation. And really, all I'm going to do is take the salad bowl and rock it back and forth. And notice that as I rock the salad bowl back and forth, and I'm being careful about exactly when I do that, it makes the amplitude of the marble's oscillation get bigger. And any phenomenon that acts to increase the amplitude can be referred to as driving, especially if it's a periodic action. When, if, if something sort of just gives our oscillator a kick at the beginning and then it oscillates, we don't usually refer to that as driving. Driving is usually an ongoing periodic phenomenon that acts to increase the amplitude. But notice that when I was done driving, did you see what the marble did? It's, it's not moving anymore. And that's because after I stopped driving it, the amplitude decreased. And we describe that, or we ascribe that, to a, the, the flip side of driving, a phenomenon we call damping. And, and damping happens uh, when something is robbing the oscillator of energy. Um, in this case, it's going to be you know, rolling resistance or friction, something that acts to steadily decrease the amplitude over time. Damping is typically ongoing as opposed to periodic in this way that driving was typically periodic. We could, if we wanted more damping, you want the amplitude to decrease more rapidly, all you have to do is increase the amount of rolling resistance. The last concept in this list is the idea of modes of oscillation. Some oscillators can oscillate in different ways. Like if we look at this mass that's hanging on a spring, it can swing like a pendulum, or it can bounce like a normal mass on a swing, or it can kind of do both things at once. That's confusing. I mean, I, let's just face it. Normally, we try to look at an oscillator that's working in just one mode. We say, this is working like a pendulum, or this is a a, a, a a mass bouncing on a spring. But you should know that sometimes oscillators have more than one mode of oscillation. Um, it just it comes up now and then. There it is going like a pendulum and then it will start to bounce again. We usually try to get it to do just one. One kind of interesting note, if you look carefully, notice that those two modes of oscillation, if you are just counting in your head, those two modes, they don't have the same period of oscillation or the same amplitude but they're happening at the same time. Anyway, not crucial. What matters here is that you know these basic terms. You know what they mean. Um, and then those three central ones, amplitude, period, and frequency, that you know how to apply them in 
the lab, all of these things are things you should recognize when somebody else says them, or you should be able to use them in a sentence. Okay, that's it. Oscillator terms.